What a wonderful day God has given us to worship him. We're so glad that you're here, and it's great to have Dr. Jesse Middendorf in worship with us. He is an amazing man. He, he, is, he was a pastor, uh, was elected to the highest office in the Church of the Nazarene as a general superintendent, but the thing that I think most endears him to my heart is his love for the development of pastors. We need great pastors in the church, and he believes in that. He invests in us and in, is engaged in the Center for Pastoral Leadership and is actively engaged in the development of pastors in the Church of the Nazarene. That resonates with my heart, and I value his investment in us and appreciate that so much, Dr. Middendorf. You, if you missed last night, my goodness, did you miss a wonderful service, and I know that you will not be disappointed in what it is that God has laid on his heart to share with us today. Will you join me in welcoming Dr. Jesse Middendorf this morning? Thank you, Terry. Bless you. Thank you, and what an honor it is for me to be here today on this Faith Promise Sunday. That last song I would like to uh, bottle up and carry with me everywhere. What an incredible truth in those words. And that's what we're here for. That's why we're here, what we're all about in the work of the kingdom of God. And it's great to be able to be here today to represent what God is doing, but to let you know it is far bigger than any one of us or all of us put together. God is at work in the world. I, I wish I could take you with me to some of the places where God is so at work that no human person can take any credit for it. It is far outside the capability of any individual to ever say, I did this. These sovereign movements of God, I'll talk a little bit about today. I want you to, to hear what God is trying to say to all of us in a mission Sunday. I mean, what in the world are we doing on a day like this when ordinarily you'd get to hear your pastor preach? And you've got a great pastor. I think you probably already know that, but just wanted to let you know. I think you've got a terrific pastor and staff. So why would we interrupt the flow of things to have somebody else come in? Well, sometimes it takes a different voice to reinforce what we've already known and heard and to be able to help us to get a little different grasp on what is going on. You see, the gospel is not a commodity we're trying to sell to the world. You're aware of that. The gospel is the announcement that in Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God has come. It is not going to come. It is here already, underway, already, not yet complete. It will be consummated at His return. But in the meantime, you and I are living, breathing, and acting demonstrations that the kingdom of God is here. And we move into darkness. We move into places where people are hopeless, helpless, fearful, consumed by self-interest to the extent that they don't even know they're destroying the other people around them. And the gospel, and the gospel alone speaks to all of those issues. It doesn't take them out of where they are. It instead intends to invest them where they are, just as you and I are invested where we are, that we might be demonstrations that the kingdom of God has come. Did you know that you are a missionary? Now, in the technical sense, you may not be receiving support from the World Evangelism Fund. But in the truest sense of the word, you and I are on mission. Let me ask you to turn with me to a passage of Scripture. It's in the history book of the New Testament church. It's the book of Acts in chapter 1. I want to begin reading in chapter 1, verse 1. Follow along, if you will. In my former book, Theophilus. I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day He was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles He had chosen. After His suffering, He presented Himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that He was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while He was eating with them, He gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem. But wait for the gift my Father promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. 
Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he responded, it's none of your business. Or words to that effect. He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the very ends of the earth. I want to talk to you today about extravagant grace in unexpected places. It's extravagant because it's grace. It's prevenient grace at work. It's the grace of God reaching out before us. So let's talk for a little bit about what God is doing. We know that great John 3.16, for God so loved the world, He gave His Son, and we know all that that implies. We worship a missional God. God is not passively sitting by waiting for us to work. God is at work. And this missional God has brought us to be a part of a missional church, the Church of the Nazarene here in Greenville, this, this wonderful congregation, this long-term uh, effort and effectiveness that you've had here is but one part of what we are. There are over 30 thousand congregations in the Church of the Nazarene around the world. And every one of us have a mission right where we are. But every one of us also has a mission for the rest of the world. That's why we're thinking together today about all of these flags representing the people groups around the world. You and I serve a missional God. We're part of a missional church. And we, you and I, are part of the missional effort. We are a missional people. We have work to do. And that passage that I just read is a wonderful promise. We sometimes read it as a command, or as it's called sometimes in Matthew 28, the Great Commission. But I would want you to hear these words. This is what Jesus said. In a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Dear friend, when the Holy Spirit takes up residence in your life, you become a part of the mission force. I might remind us that you're either a part of the mission field or a part of the mission force. And I think you and I need to know that we all, all of us, are a part of the mission force force. We are to be carrying the message. We are to be demonstrating the message. You and I are to be living it out. I've been reading a book recently, The Patient Ferment of the Early Church. It's a fascinating book. It talks about the first 300 years of the history of the church of Jesus Christ. Then the first 300 years, the, the church did not have the office of evangelist or missionary. The church was the church. And in 300 years, the church by being the church, by patiently living out its witness, by living out the principles of the Sermon on the Mount, within 300 years, the church that began with 12 people and then 120 people and then 3,000 and then 5,000 and then multitudes in 300 years had taken over the Roman Empire. I don't know about you, but that's astounding to me because the promise was made. You will be my witnesses. It flows out of you. That's happening around the world. I wish I could tell you some of the places that have been transformed by the grace of God. <clears throat> I had an anthropologist say to me while I was a pastor and come to me one day, a professor of anthropology at a secular university, and I was talking about our mission to the world. And I brought up Papua New Guinea that I'll be talking about a bit later and talked about how the gospel was making a dramatic difference in the lives of people in Papua New Guinea. And this, 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 this anthropologist came to me and he said to me, sir, I, I, I hate to differ with you, but don't you really believe that when we bring our Western religions into a place like Papua New Guinea, we take the innocence of the people and we destroy it? And I said to him, let me tell you about the innocence of the people in Papua New Guinea. They live every moment of their lives in terror. 
They're fearful of the spirits. They're fearful of the demons in the trees, in the animals, in the, in the flowers. When the storm comes and lightning flashes, they are terrified of the demons that are out to destroy them. They are so terrified. They live in such fear. They have such hopelessness that if they see a member of another tribe that they believe is a threat to them, their only recourse in their mind, their only recourse is to kill them, and in some cases to boil them and eat them. Then I said to him, if that is what you call innocence, I'm glad we are addressing their innocence. And he stood there with his mouth open for a moment. He said, I had never thought about it that way. And I said, well, let me tell you what is happening. When tribes begin to receive the gospel in Papua New Guinea, everything so changes in that tribal culture that other tribes around them begin to say, what is it that you have found? What has changed you? How did you get to be this way? And they begin to tell them, well, we found Jesus. And it transforms cultures. So you and I have a responsibility. That's why Paul would write to the Colossians as he did there in that, whoops. Wonder what I did there. There it is. It's back. Good. Uh, We have a response. Paul wrote to the Colossians in chapter 1, verses 28 and 29 in the New and the uh, Living Bible. So everywhere we go, we talk about Christ to everyone who will listen warning everyone, teaching everyone as well as we know how. We want to present everyone to God perfect because of what Christ Jesus has done for them. This is my work, he said, and we can do this because Christ's mighty energy is at work within us. That is our work. Well, let me give you some Nazarene fast facts. You already have a lot of them in your bulletin, some wonderful depictions of what God is doing. But very quickly, just to tell you, there are 30,000 congregations, 2.4 million members in the church of, uh, members of the Church of the Nazarene around the world, $38.2 million given last year for World Evangelism Fund, another $31 million for approved mission specials, 710 Jesus film teams. Now, let me show you a statistic here that just takes my breath. 76,780,000 evangelistic contacts since 1998 with the Jesus Film Ministry. That takes my breath. Hard to imagine. As a result of that, just this past year, 728,000 decisions for Christ in 2016 and over 5,400 new preaching points in 2016 because just of the Jesus film alone. Breathtaking to see what God is doing. God's up to something. In 2016, 13 new members of the Church of the Nazarene. Whoa. Wow, it's working very well, faster than I am. Back up here. In uh, uh, last year, 13 new churches of the Nazarene organized every week. 333, 83 people became new members of the Church of the Nazarene every day last year. And the membership growth over the last decade has been over 53%. And 12,000 children are sponsored through Nazarene Compassionate Ministries, in addition to a variety of other ways that we minister to children through child development centers. Nazarene Global Mission is now deployed in 162 world areas. It's amazing. I've been to most of those, and it takes my breath away. Let me just talk to you a few minutes about this unexpected grace. We never take God where He is not. Everywhere we go, God gets there ahead of us. Mission is prevenient grace at work in the world. So God is our advance team everywhere we're going. There's some miracle stories I'd like to tell you. There is the nation of Nepal. You'll see that uh, north of Nepal is China, and uh, this is India. Uh, There are a lot of uh, incredible mountains. You may have heard of one of them called Mount Everest, K7, the big mountain. And uh, you can't imagine how big the mountain is until you're there. I was in Kathmandu and had an incredible visit there in, uh, in Uh, Nepal for several days. I want to talk to you about, just for a moment, contemporary heroes. This is in uh, our our district superintendent, Dilly, and his wife. This man was a government uh, employee. 
in charge of education in the nation of Nepal. He had an incredible encounter with Christ. It rearranged him, turned his life upside down. He resigned from his position and became a minister in the Church of the Nazarene. I had the privilege of ordaining him. He now is our district superintendent and the head of our mission there in Nepal, and he and his wife are two of the most courageous people I know. He has this gentle spirit that you think is just never going to be uh, throwing a lot of energy into something. He just sort of laid back and calm and cool, but inside a fire burns all the time. And he is helping us plant an amazing number of churches in Nepal. You, know, you may be aware that just a few years ago there was a major earthquake, but right now there are 230, uh, 200 churches, 35 church-type missions, 35 child development centers, and a strong youth involvement. Right now, 300 young people are being trained in disciple-making ministries. And in April of last year, two years ago, a 7.8 magnitude earthquake. It was devastating. The capital, Kathmandu, was utterly paralyzed. The entire nation was staggered. 10,000 people killed. Uh, 25,000 people were injured. It was uh, one of the times when there was absolutely no capacity in Nepal to meet all the needs that were there. The nation was absolutely paralyzed. But Nazarene Compassionate Ministries became a major contributor and a partner in ministry. And God began to do a new work in Nepal, in part because many of us gave to the emergency fund that was raised for Nepal, and God is doing some incredible things there. I'm awfully glad that we're in Nepal and doing what God is doing there. It's one of the most exciting places I've been. And then Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka is just a small island nation that uh, is south of, of India in the uh, Indian Ocean. It's a miracle of God's grace. Uh, a miracle of evangelistic impact, and it is a miracle because there was uh, a tremendous amount of damage done in 2004 with the Christmas tsunami, and over a 30-year period of time, the nation was in a civil war that divided it right down the middle, and there were people that were losing their lives, good, solid Christians in many cases who were assassinated because they dared to preach the gospel. But God has been doing a, a wonderful work. There's Sri Lanka. It used to be called Ceylon. If you like tea, you probably have drunk Ceylon tea. It's some of the best you'll find anywhere. By the way, the Nazarene mission is on what was an abandoned tea plantation. The abandoned tea plantation, though, was kept up by the people who lived in the village. And when the Nazarenes bought the uh, tea plantation, the people in the village said, if you'll allow us to do it, we will continue to cultivate the tea if you'll allow us to sell it. So now there is Nazarene Sri Lankan tea on the market, and it is doing some great work for us. It's a nation divided by war for 30 years, a nation that was devastated by the Christmas tsunami. 30,000 people killed, 21,000 injured. NCM helped to literally rebuild coastal towns and villages. It was so devastated that there would be nothing where there had been 30 or 40,000 people completely washed away. NCM came in and they said to us, would you be willing to move into some of these areas and bring a team of people and establish a home of some kind? And would you bring one of your child development centers? There was no education available. And so we said, of course, we'll bring a child development center, but there is a requirement. Everywhere we bring a child development center, we must also be allowed to put a church because our people who are working there need a place of worship. Oh, they said, feel free to do that. It's another religion majority nation, but they said, uh, just, just build your church for your people and train our children in your child development centers. Well, one of the curricula pieces there in the child development centers, they teach them to read in their language. They teach them to read by reading the Bible. And when the parents come to hear their children recite their reading and learning the verses that they've learned, the parents are thrilled to death, and they say, well, this is wonderful. How do you support all of this? Well, our, our people in the, in the U.S. are the ones who primarily support it. They, they give special offerings for our World Evangelism Fund and Compassionate Ministries, but they also support their churches by tithing. And the people of that village said, well, we understand tithing in our religion too. Could we tithe to your church? 
oh my word, do you say no? <laughs> we said, of course. Once you begin to invest yourself in something like that, it begins to get to your heart. And the child development centers have begun to be the means by which evangelism is taking hold in Sri Lanka. Now, the war was finished. After the end of the war, the government asked NCM to be one of the first organizations to move into the war-torn north. And here's what they said. We need your child development centers. And we said, our Sri Lankan leader said what they always say, well, we'll be glad to establish child development centers, but you must remember, wherever we put a child development center, we must have a church because we work with the church in our child development centers. And we will have to be honest with you, we will invite people to come to our churches. Well, they said, it is so devastated. We don't think you'll have many people come to your churches, but we need your child development centers. Why don't you go right ahead? And so they did. Well, guess what happened? The churches have begun to flourish and grow. Lives are being transformed. Communities are being changed. Tensions are being dissolved as people begin to learn to love one another. And because of what Christ is doing in that place, we're planting churches so fast that our records in Kansas City simply cannot keep up with what God is doing. That's why I give to the World Evangelism Fund to support that kind of thing. By the way, did you know that 87 cents of every dollar you give goes directly into the mission? It does not support the structure. It goes directly into the mission. There is hardly any organization anywhere that puts that much of your dollar back in directly into the mission. That's why the best investment you can make in kingdom giving is through the World Evangelism Fund. Faith Promise is the way that we fund that. Those are Sri Lankan kids. That, that crowd of kids, when I got ready to take this picture, I thought were going to run me over because all of them wanted to be in the picture. I had three or four kids there. The next thing I knew, everybody was in the picture. And I said, okay, I'll take it. I cherish that picture. Those eyes still get into my heart. And then uh, there they are at one of the tables in the child developments that are learning and that little guy wanted to know if he could come home with me. And I'd have brought him home in a heartbeat if I could have done it. It was an incredible experience. Bangladesh. Bangladesh is quite a place. This is India. This is India. Uh, that's Bhutan. Right over here is Myanmar. That's a place in Bangladesh. That uh, river that runs right through it floods every year to the extent that most of Bangladesh, especially the lower half of Bangladesh, floods annually. Sometimes more devastating than others, but it's an incredible place. Uh, Bangladesh is one of my favorite places, in part because this is a district assembly. The district assembly where I went for this particular one, there were 2,500 delegates. That's three times the size of the general assembly. It was an incredible gathering. See the people dressed in white in the center? This is the graduation ceremony that occurred during the district assembly for 196 graduates of the South Asian Nazarene Bible College. And I had the privilege, along with three colleagues from the general superintendents that I took with me, two of them were, were uh, emeriti, Dr. Nina Gunter, you've heard of her, and uh, Dr. Jim Deal, and Dr. Uh, Eugenio Duarte, who at that time was one of our newly elected general superintendents, and I went. I was in jurisdiction there, and I realized I was going to have to have some help because we ordained 193 people in one service, a four-hour-long service. By the way, the temperature in that room right there was 117 degrees. Oh, my word. 196 Bible College graduates, and we ordained 33 women. As far as we can tell, the very first women in history to be ordained as elders in the Church of Jesus Christ in Bangladesh. They are some of our most courageous pastors, and they continually are under pressure, continually under threat of death because they serve Jesus Christ. Bangladesh. The work began in 1994, 2001. We had 10 churches and less than 1,000 members, but a plan was in place. They were following the leadership of the Holy Spirit, and 
in 2016, we had 100,000 members in 3,500 churches, all of that in the space of 16 years. A movement of God. No one can say, I did it. Only the Holy Spirit could do that. It's an incredible place where God is doing some phenomenal things, and the miracle continues. Papua New Guinea. Oh, I wish I could take you to Papua New Guinea. One of the places that still has left a Papua New Guinea-sized hole in my heart. I want to go back every chance I get. We've been there for a number of years. It's a grace-filled church. I was there for the dedication of the new hospital building. Our hospital is 50 years old. We operated in what were temporary quarters for the hospital for over 45 years. And now we have the new hospital. There we are at the dedication. You see the lays. By the time we got to the end of that long procession of people, there were 12 lays around my neck, and I could barely see to walk. But the aroma was incredible. They were all fresh flowers. And God would see all the flower petals flying in the air, you can tell there. P&G generosity. I flew into Dusan in Papua New Guinea. Dusan is on a mountaintop. Dusan is a 45-minute flight away from our home site where the hospital is in uh, Kujip. But, but Dusan has no roads. I don't mean not good roads. I mean no roads. It's in the mountains where the valleys and peaks are so steep that trying to build a road of any kind is virtually impossible. It is a three-day walk from Dusan to the nearest automobile of any kind. Three days. But it's the most gorgeous place in the world. I flew in in a single-engine airplane. As many of you may know that I, I've been a pilot for 35 years. I love flying. Uh, I flew in on a single-engine airplane into Dusan. Uh, I nearly swore off flying at that date. <laughs> the runway was on the top of a mountain that had been carved off, and it was at a 16-degree grade. It was only 1,500 feet long. It was at an altitude of 6,000 feet. And when you fly into a, an airport like that in a small plane, you are dumb. I mean, it is just, you just can't do that. But we did it. Single engine Cessna 207. When we landed, there were a thousand people waiting for us, just like that crowd you saw earlier. And I was there for the district assembly. I ordained 10 or 12 people there that day. It was a, the, the beauty is indescribable. Flowers that you and I pay hundreds of dollars for to decorate things, they're just just everywhere. They just grow wild. They cut them down and just get them out of the way. And I couldn't believe the beauty of the place. The zone leader for one of the zones in the district was saying, we live in the most beautiful place in the world. Uh, we have no cash, he said, but who needs cash in the mountains? We have everything we need. Our fields are producing, and we eat all that we need. In fact, we have more than we need. We give food away to the tribes around us. He said, our pigs are producing. When you have pigs, he said, you're wealthy. We don't have cash, but we've got pigs. And we eat the pigs, and we give the pigs away. We sell a pig now and then. We, we, it's just wonderful. We have everything we need. God has been so good to us. We live in the most beautiful place in the world. And uh, he said, uh, our coffee trees are bearing more coffee beans this year than ever in our memory. Well, we could see the coffee trees around us. The red beans were ready for harvest. And he said, well, you know, we like to sell our coffee, but to sell the coffee, you have to put the beans in bags and walk for three days. I don't mean they'd walk for a while and then sleep. I mean, when they carry the beans, 50-pound bags per person on their back, they start walking, and they do not stop walking for three days. He said, three days to sell coffee? Nah, we just drink the coffee. <laughs> but then he said, and this was in 2009, then he said, we have heard that a global economic crisis is developing. How would you know about a global economic crisis in the mountains of Papua New Guinea? He said, we hear that it is affecting the ability of the church to send missionaries. You might even have to bring missionaries home, he said. We cannot imagine that. 
So, he said, we took our beans to market. Did you hear what I said about the coffee bags? 50 pound bags. 25 men carried 50 pound bags on their backs for three days and took their beans to market. Then he reached into his belum on his side and pulled out a wad of bills rolled up with an old rubber band around it. And he said to me, so we took our beans to market and General Superintendent, we have cash. And I'd like to present to you the World Evangelism Fund from the Doosan District in Papua New Guinea paid in full for every church. This is our gift that we give because you sent missionaries to us and changed our lives. We want to help you send missionaries every place else. I took that water bills about that big around, bigger than a softball. I took that water bills. I put it in my, my luggage. I carried it with me all the way back to Kansas City. And some of you heard me tell about the story from Cuba last night where I called the general treasurer in. That Cuba experience was two years after this experience when I called the general treasurer again, Dr. McCool, and I said to her, let's get a chapel together. I'd like to make a presentation to you. And that morning, I brought it home. I didn't have it exchanged. I brought it home in Papua New Guinea bills. It was that big around. And I gave that to her that morning and said to her, Dr. McCool, the Doosan District in Papua New Guinea has paid its World Evangelism Fund in full. Here it is. Needless to say, there were tears all around that room. They gave out of their lack. Oh, he said, we have everything we need but we have no cash. If we could, we'd send our pigs and our flowers and our garden. But we know that you can't carry pigs on the airplane. So we took our beans to market. How will you engage the mission? I love this letter of Paul. Since you excel in everything, in faith and speech and knowledge and complete earnestness and in the love we've kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. Tell you what, let's take our beans to market. Thanks be to God. Thank you. So this morning, uh, we are prepared to, uh, to give a faith promise pledge. And my wife and I have filled out ours. There are ushers that are prepared to come and receive your pledge. Now, a pledge doesn't necessarily mean, what is it that I can afford? A pledge is, what do I believe by faith that God would help me to give? And so with that in mind, uh, we'd encourage you, if you've not already done so, to tear out your faith promise pledge there and uh, fill that out. We're going to uh, be counting them, and uh, I, think, I think our folks that would normally conclude have, uh, have already stepped away. Uh, so uh, let me pray for this offering, this, uh, excuse me, this pledge, and uh, let's ask what the Lord would have us to give. Father, we thank you so much for for letting us participate in something that is miraculous, that men and women around the world are impacted by, by giving that is extended to you, not from that which we don't need, but from, from that which we do. And, and the joy that comes in the giving. Father, Help us not to have a limited vision today for what it is that you would like us to pledge to you, but give us a heart of faith 
so that this faith promise would be an opportunity to give you praise as you provide the gift. We love you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen.